Hi, my name is John Sunman, and this is the third part of my conversation with the synthetic biologist George Church that we had in his laboratory office in March of 2015. If you haven't seen the first and second segments of the conversation, you might want to look for them, especially the first one where I have a little bit of an introduction to me and to George and how it came about that we were having this conversation in the first place. In this third segment, uh, I asked George what he foresees in the next 15 years. Uh, I think one of the more intriguing things he said was that maybe we'll be able to do within 15 years virtually everything that we now do with physics we'll be able to do with biology. For example, build a house with biology. Have organisms build your house for you instead of using hammers and nails. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I enjoyed having it. And uh, leave me comments or send me an email. Thanks. What is, what is your personal uh, vision of where these technologies, especially the, the, the biological technologies that you're pioneering, where they are taking us? And let me just give you a little thing. So yeah. when I, I was introduced to you by our mutual friend, Chris Bremser, yeah. and he, we were talking about one of my novels or something. Yeah. He said, you really got to go talk to this this buddy of mine, yeah. George Church. He said, yeah. He's really brilliant. He's really influential. But he's a bit of a Pollyanna. Yeah. So anyway, so I don't know if that's fair or not, but but uh, cause I like I like poly math better than poly. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so they are okay. Fair enough. Uh, you know, I think I, I think uh, I do enough red teaming uh, to imagine how things can go. I mean, I guess I'm as Pollyanna-ish as you can be and still be interested in in safety and existential right. risk. Right. Uh, you know. So I mean, if I really poly and I say everything's fine, we don't need to do anything about it. Right. But I'm constantly being right. disruptive, both in making new technologies and also figuring out how those technologies can go wrong and then figuring out how to fix the, the, the problems created by technologies and so forth. Ideally in advance. So if you think a few chess moves out, um, maybe you can avoid something. Uh, well, where do you but, think where do you think we'll be? Fifteen years from now, yeah. looking at at the wars that are going on now, looking yeah. at biological trends, looking at yeah. social economic trends, and health yeah. improvement trends. So, uh, so that's a longish question, but uh, you know, I think I used to think sixty years was uh, a reasonable prediction range, yeah. but then then the prediction was that it would take us sixty years to get to an affordable genome from a three billion dollar genome, and right. it happened in six years rather than six decades. Right. And so now I started thinking, well, maybe six years is kind of the event horizon. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you asked for 15, 15 which is kind of a, a reasonable be beyond uh, kind of a really huge technological shift. We, you know, right. uh, a million-fold change in our ability to read and write DNA is about as big a sea change as, as right. most people have seen. And if it happens in six years, then 15 years is a lot of time. That said, I think that you know right now, we're still very addicted to the last industrial revolution, sort of the or the last couple, which was uh, sort of the Edisonian, Newtonian, you know, optics, electromagnetism, that kind right. of stuff, followed by atomic and information revolutions, and we haven't really gotten into the biology, and the, and the fact is biology. Um, has the potential of replacing all of those in the sense that there's almost nothing we manufacture now that we couldn't manufacture as well or better with biology. Right. Biology is atomically precise, it's dirt cheap, and it will grow itself, it will make exponentially make copies of itself, and possibly with a doubling time of 11 minutes, which is a record for doubling time of any organism, which we happen to work with in our lab here. Uh, and in principle, it could be maybe a little faster than that. Maybe it could be applied to, usually big things don't replicate that fast. But if you had a big vat of this organism, right. you know, Vibrio uh, or E. coli, it could make another big vat the same size uh, in, you know, yeah. 11 to 20 minutes, right? right. Um, now, the making of the vat itself and the food that goes into it, of course, that's an external thing. But in principle, it can double in, given... Right. the right environment in 11 minutes. And that's, all of that's pretty exciting, the atomic precision, the self-replication, the evolution, 
all of this are, are features that don't happen in other fields of, of engineering. And that's why I think the future is going to be largely biology and biologically inspired engineering. So what does that, what does that amount to? Uh, I think uh, you know, one of our grand challenges from a exist all of it's, I think, motivated by existential. I mean, we can pretend like we don't understand what ethics is. Right. We can pretend like we don't understand what the real point of, you know, religion and morality is. But, but it has something to do with existential uh, issues. Yeah. And, uh, and so one of the ex biggest existential issues is the Earth is going to be destroyed, right? Yeah. Whether, you know, a billion years from now when the sun expands or sooner than that with some asteroid uh, and we need to or, get off of it. Or the ice caps melt. And so we need to get off of it. Uh, the ice cap melting would probably not destroy the earth. It will right, not destroy true. all all life on the planet. Right. And, you know, it, or even all human life. Um, but it might destroy civilization. But I like, I'm it not almost certain. It, no, right. it's a good interruption. It, it, it could, there are many things that could destroy civilization. There yeah. are probably many more things that could destroy the civilization than destroy the earth. And so we need to get off because there's that guaranteed existential risk. And then we also, I think, we need to get off because we need diversity. And we had diversity when we were all little tribes where everybody would die within a few meters of where they were born. And everybody knew everybody in the tribe. And as soon as you made a new tribe, it immediately started diversifying its language, its culture, its inventions. And it would forget the old ones. You know, So it wasn't really progress necessarily. Right, right. It was a little bit. It was just like cultural evolution was very much like biological evolution. Right. And that was a good thing. But now we have one culture. I mean, almost. Yeah, yeah. And it's predictable. If we keep going on this path, we're going to increasingly have a single, a monoculture where we all wear, you know, Friday level business suits. You know, right, take right. the tie off, you know, right, right. or something. Who knows? But something that we all speak English. You know, we all yeah, listen to some the watered down of, rock music. Yeah, yeah. and etc. And uh, and that's probably not healthy. The history that we learn from evolution is that monocultures die right. faster. Than diverse ones, and monoculture is going to be, you know, or highly specific uh, life strategies can be good for a while, while while the while everything is constant. But if anything changes, then you're in trouble. And so, what we really need are that's the second reason we need to get off the planet is we need lots of experiments in cultures, and ideally that they would be isolated like this. I mean, this this village that you described. Yeah. The problem with it was it was all about nostalgia and going back in yes, time. Exactly. But we need our experiments to go forward in time, where we say, wow, what is a possible future? And the thing is, if you have enough imagination, you can think of many possible futures. You can right. think of one where everybody f from birth is uh, taught a new language. Right. Not English, but something that's very, very based on um, the facts of the world, right? right. You can even say it's like a scientific culture. Right. So instead of having like every element of the periodic, this is one of my pet peeves, every element of the periodic table is a little story that right. doesn't have anything to do with the element. You right. know? It's like hydrogen doesn't tell you that it has a single proton. Right. You know, helium doesn't tell you it has two. two. You know? yeah. And so what if they were called, he he hydrogen was called one and helium yeah. was called two. two. Right. And, yeah. and why decimal? Why not binary? Right? Yeah. You know, binary is the only real base that makes any sense. Right. right? So anyway, you could imagine something where you build up, you know, where, where you don't have to learn all these stories. I mean, you can still make stories, but the stories are based on a different... Right, right. And so you have this completely synthetic culture of that sort. You can have another one that's kind of at the other end of the spectrum, where it's all stories. Yeah. You know, it's like, why have any logic at all, you know? Right. Throw it out the window, you know? Right, try, right. try that for a while. And I think it, that has been tried. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. Anyway, I think there's a lot of parallel universes that yeah. one could create, uh, parallel human cultures that one create. But they have to be isolated. They have to be at least somewhat isolated. Right. And that is a very difficult decision to make. Because in the sort of society that would be wealthy enough to send us off. So then that brings us back uh, to another basic issue. It's before we start doing all the space stuff, which is important from an existential risk, but it's not important. We, we we're pretty sure that no asteroid is going to hit us in the next, say, right. 500 years. Um, 
we need to eliminate poverty because then we have the wealth to con con right. It's, it becomes less of a trade-off. You know, right now we think we have the wealth, or we thought we had the wealth to do the moon. That was a that was a really big economic risk, right? right? In fact, we drove the Soviet Union into bankruptcy with all of our shenanigans with with space and ICBMs and right, stuff right, like right. that. Uh, we, if we can eliminate poverty, it becomes kind of a, towards end game, it becomes a, a, a virtuous, virtuous cycle, cycle. Yeah. because you've got poverty, education, and wealth, oh, sorry, and health, and they make a little loop that if yeah. you, if you can fix any of those a, a little bit, just yeah. like if you decrease or increase the wealth slightly, then they can pay for the health and education. If right. you can improve the education, they're going to want to improve their health and hence their wealth. Anyway. Um, you get that to a point where really nobody is spend you know, right now a huge fraction of human time and energy is going towards um, dealing with the consequences of infectious diseases and psychiatric disorders and all this sort of stuff. And imagine what would happen if we still have diversity, but we just don't have all this pathological, right. you know, super right. pathological diversity. You can have you can have people that are different mentally, right. but not debilitated. Yeah. yeah, not not in pain all the time. Um, you'd have wealth. You'd have a lot more wealth, and that wealth would create wealth of its own. And then and then you'd be able to launch these things. And but it's still going to be a very difficult uh, challenge to uh, to c cut them off right. uh, in a way that's. But I I think that's where it's going. I think we're going to uh, have the biological capabilities of eliminating disease that will help us reduce poverty, um, which will help us eliminate another round of disease. Uh, and eventually we can come to a kind of a hard core of diseases where, um, <clears throat> where we're questioning our humanity a little bit. But I, my guess... That's where I come in, but... Yeah, I think it's, I think it's like... Uh, you know, I don't want us to eliminate some of the some of my diseases. You know, right. like you know, narcolepsy and ADD and dyslexia and, and all the things that make me me. You yeah. know, because I'm not normal. But but it's there's I guess there's an exception. There's a level of neural diversity that we're probably going to want to have, and it may involve a risk of whatever. You know, you're not going to have a bulk of that goes. That goes you don't want a bell curve that's a spike. Right. You might want one that's a plateau and ends sharply, but that's hard to arrange. Yep. Uh, so, you know, we're probably going to have tails that go out that cause yep. that cause some of the pain that we have today. Yeah. Um, now we might have ways that we can kind of like dial it up and down. So yep. if I want to be bipolar for a few days, I can crank up the yep, right, right. crank it up, and then if I want to be cured, it's it's much easier to cure me. That's right? like in. Um, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Yeah, remember that? Oliver Sacks. Oliver yeah. Sacks. The witty Ticky Ray was the guy who had Tourette's. Yeah, and he, that he, was him. And he didn't like it. They'd say he could dial it back, but he found out he lost his wit. He lost uh, his, yeah. uh, you know. So he right. just dialed it back up again. He yeah. didn't want to. But at least he had that choice. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I think that there are many uh, people that when they get depressed or or something bad happens in their life. That when it inter interacts with something that's normally highly adaptive, it makes it much less adaptive. And at that point, they'll turn it down for a while while their life straightens out. Right. And maybe they're less creative. Maybe they're less the, the you know, center of the party, yep. but they can deal better. Yep. And then yep. they'll crank it back up again when, when, when their life changes. Anyway, I don't know, but it just seems like having that ability. Now, we want the problem is we have better ability to do that than we've ever had before. And they're called addictive drugs, you know, right. or, or even uh, recreational drugs, where instead of doing our jobs, instead of dealing with our families and our relationships, we go off into recreation land. Right. And not just drugs, but electronics and right. You know, addiction, uh, uh, social uh, uh, addictions of various sorts. And giving us those knobs hasn't helped us, right? Right. But there may be a new set of knobs, and you know, hope springs eternal. This is where right. Pollyanna comes in. Yeah. Is uh, you know, for example, there's a class, there's a new um, class of 
pain a pain uh, pathway yep. um, where you can find people who don't experience pain. You know, and there, there's at least two two well known mutants where you can basically they stick pens in themselves right. and, they, and they're at risk because right. you know they will they'll chew on their tongue and right, stuff right, like right, that. Yeah. They're at risk. But imagine you could turn that on and off. Right. But the fact is, when they're pain free, and it's really pain free, it's not like it's low pain. So when they're pain free, they are not dopey. Right. They're not like a heroin addict that's that's like pain or, or, free, or for that pain. matter, a a surgical patient that's under anesthesia right. or under uh, uh, opiates. Yeah. Who are really dopey? You can't talk to them. They can't work. These people are perfectly fine, except they're at risk. For hurting themselves, right. right? Wouldn't that be cool, right? right? You know, so there are things like that that make me feel like there probably are ways that we can uh, achieve neural diversity and have dials on it right. without becoming dysfunctional, right. you know, or, or, or you know, where the dial doesn't take us off into something that's addictive and uh, where you're no longer really human, right. where you're not the, the human. That you want to be, or you wanted to be when you were young. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a very interesting angle, and we're going to get much better at reading and writing to our own brains. Or to, right, right. And that's going to be a big deal. Well, that's. That, and I'm not sure it's going to be electronic. You know, right. I think it, it could be, again, almost purely biological. Everything we can do right now with physics, we might be able to do with biology. Mm -hmm.